So we've just entered into the park. We've not got any further really than the, the side of the car park. And um, Glenn, who has come along uh, for his mediumistic skills amongst other uh, massive talents, has picked up on a, a copper beach, birch, beach, beach, beach copper beach tree um, with its energy that it was kicking out. So you were attracted to it straight away, weren't you? What kind of things were you picking um, up on? My heart chakra just expanded. It was pulsating and it was like that magnetic draw. And I was simply just drawn to it. And then I just felt like I had to do a bit of psychometrizing on the actual bark of the tree. Upon doing that, I was just told by my guide that it's, um, it's a portal for natural elementals to come through. And then they show me the, the vision of... Um, what I would describe like a wisp, which is like, um, it was a grey smoky sort of entity, if you like, very natural, not, you know, not displaying any negative traits or anything. But I just saw like, um, this kind of a being, not human form, just like energy in, you know, an entity sort of shape coming from that bark there. And, um, and yeah, it was fascinating, really nice. You know, I could literally stay here all day. I just feel so chilled. Yeah very peaceful and I think because we're all coming here with the intention of respect and of love then that is being um, magnified back to us. That's good, uh, great start, absolutely great start and as we were going around the tree we are all kind of picking out faces weren't we and we were talking about pareidolia and, and what that is. And Yeah, par pareidolia, I mean that's the reductionist explanation for um, faces or images that you see in something like this in the tree. But you know, when you come at it from a little bit more of an esoteric perspective, you can say that these are just the real spiritual energy, whatever you want to call it, of a tree like this manifesting itself in paradelia, which we can then pick up. Yeah. So they are, in fact, symbolic represent representatives mm -hmm. of what is really here. And maybe, I don't know whether the camera's going to be able to pick this up, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, so you know, this little fellow with his nose and his weird little body, this one, this is the first one I saw with the nose there and the eye and the mouth. And, it, and yeah, it's done it again. They don't like me touching them. Well, I think it's just me. <laughs> they've, got, they've got a problem with me. But, uh, and the, the, you know, I think we've seen a dozen of, the, of these that you can spot. You, 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 you spotted them as well, haven't you? Yeah, I think for me, um, when I came up to the tree, um, and put my, my hand on it and you know there's always a sense of is it okay to you know yes. is there a sense is, is this all right um but immediately when i looked up i saw a um creamy yellow um light uh, kind of fuzzy around the edges shoot off from where the darker part of that knobbly part of the wood there and, and outwards and I was immediately looking then to see where could that light be coming from but there's not any light being filtered through the trees here so there's definitely something that's attracted us to the tree as, as you uh, pointed out and I feel like um, you know through the paradoida as well we're getting some kind of communication definitely. with the tree so and, and the beings that might reside around it yeah how about you yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, it takes me a while to kind of tune into these things, and I, I kind of, uh, but I, I definitely feel it. I definitely feel a warmth, and I had that. Um, I, I, I was seeing tree aura, sort of giving off glowy tree aura, but I've not, um, I've not picked up on any uh, entity energy yet. Um, I think I'm too excited to find the gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> too excited to track them down at the minute. So, should we move on? Go mm. somewhere else. Brilliant. Hence the so. F off.
Now, come on, come, come in. Let's, okay. uh, first of all, we saw this fallen tree from, from a distance, and do you want to tell us what kind of you know, feeling and uh, resonance you got from it? Yeah, we was walking uh, just along the path it, way there, the other side, and uh, we was drawn to this area. I was just feeling like I'd been hit in the stomach, my solar plexus were feeling tight, like a tight fist sort of thing. And I started to get some interactions with this location and I felt it was um, quite a low vibrational being. Speaking of bees, I think just a good air one now. A uh, low vibrational being um, and it was, I was being shown it uh, running in a circle around this tree and kind of urinating, like marking its territory. I was hearing it hissing, growling and um, very unpleasant, didn't want us here, so um, Kate being Kate says we need to go and have a look. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no, that's right. And uh, I, you know, I, it's, it's not a great atmosphere here, I find. It's a slight, mm. not, not nasty resonance, but something putting off, putting us off. You know, the, the entity, whatever it is, yeah. is just telling you in such and such language. Yeah. And of course, going on the pareidolia, um, uh, the thing that we were talking about earlier on. What about this, for any of you familiar with the paintings and images of Brian Frood, the great Brian Frood, how's that for a Frood fairy? You can't get better than that. I, I don't even dare to touch it because I don't think it's going to like me. And I don't think... <laughs> I don't think it's something I should do. Touch it! Touch it! <laughs> <laughs> Away with you. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, oh sticky mud. Jesus Christ, Benton! Have you ever seen this video? We've got to watch this. It's a one minute video in a London park. I think it's Regent's Park, maybe Bushy Park. Is it real? Oh yeah, well it's genuine. It's, uh, and have you seen Benton the dog? We've got to watch it. Remind me to show you it, just a minute. And so it's just some Japanese tourists just filming the, this herd of deer, big herd of deer. And then they start to sort of get nervous. Yeah. And they start stampeding down, down the hill. And as they go down the hill, you see this black Labrador, quite in the distance, charging after them. It's obviously that's what's hurt, hurting them. Yeah. And then after the black dog, the black dog. Labrador chases him halfway down the hill. You hear Benton! Benton! Oh Jesus Christ! Benton! And then you see him, some, some sort of, you know, big middle aged old bloke down the hill. That's it, but it's so funny to watch. So funny to watch. And every time I see a herd of deer, I'm expecting a Fenton the dog. What a name for a dog. <laughs> Sounds like it's going to be some kind of. Um... Uh, sedative, pharmaceutical sedative, doesn't it, fentanyl? Fentanyl. Right. About that high. Ooh, look at the size of those polypores. Oh yeah. And I think there's some on that. That one up there. Let's get the polypores now. Yeah. <laughs> This is like, it looked like an old man about that, that tall, but he went like, how can I describe it? Like outwardly, inwardly, like that sort of, his image was there and it went, and went in in itself. And what, disappeared? Like he got turned inside out. Oh. It was, you know, like someone's been taking the air out of them. I've just seen that there in my mind's eye. It's like a small old man. My guys are saying he doesn't smell very nice, Glenn. <laughs> He's got like um, an unwashed body type of smell. So we've come off piste a bit and we're not going to say too loudly that we may be trespassing um, as Neil takes himself out on the, uh, on the lovely holly. So where we've just come from, I uh, just want to have a quick chat about uh, the different feelings that we were getting from the, the space we've just been into this space. Jo, you, you've been picking up on stuff, haven't you? Mm. Yeah, as we approached the area and there was a bit of a break in the fence, I felt, hmm, really want to get in there. <laughs> um, 
there's a tree over there that I don't know if you can catch in with the bluebells but um, yeah I just lay against it, I stood against it for a while and connected with it with my hands and there was such a, a, a feeling of uh, white light coming from it like a healing energy it feels like it's a very giving tree a very giving spot um, and almost as if something is reaching through it to me one the, the uh, vision I saw was you know white hands reaching outwards not in a kind of spooky creepy way but in a, a giving kind of way so yeah that was it, it is a lighter energy here mm. I like it mm. It's, uh, it feels like a sort of little fairy garden to me. Yeah, secret garden. We were all kind yeah. of drawn to it, weren't we? We were all kind of beeline into this. We are meant to be circumnavigating around to uh, where the gnomes were meant to have been, where we think that the gnomes were meant to have been um, been seen by the children, and we were kind of drawn, and there's something about the bluebells are, are really sort of ultraviolet, so they kind of draw you in, don't they? As always, a bluebell will, would, will draw you in because of its... Mm. its, its well, it's, it's just a, it's such a beautiful sight, isn't it? And the fact that it, you know it's only going to last for a few weeks in every year. Mm. And so when you come across it, you do feel drawn in it just at a pragmatic level. It doesn't, mm. you know, don't even have to talk about it in a spiritual or esoteric it. way. Mm. But, uh, and talking pragmatically, um, we, we are here because we're following the wall. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to make that out. It's, it's a little bit kind of um, blending into the background. But we're following the wall down to lower ground where we think the the marshland is that the the children in the, the original Wollaton gnome children where they climbed the wall into that marshland area so apart from the beautiful resonance of the place mm. we have got a very specific p purpose for following 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 the wall along um, just to show you know we're honed in we know so exactly what we're doing. And that's, we? to, that's to cover our back for the slight bit of trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> So right behind us, we've got the start of the marshland, which is the nearest part of the marshland towards the wall. Um, and if you uh, go over the other side of that uh, bank in there, that's where the bottom of the lake is. So the story of the Woolerton Gnomes is, with the kids jumping over the wall, they kind of, it felt like they were immediately within within the marshland. And we've just been discussing, you know, the the feelings that they might have been having, haven't we? Um, sort of jumping over the wall and and being in this area. Yeah, and uh, this particular, although we don't think, well we know we're not in the exact location where they encountered the gnomes of the marshland, this piece of marshland behind us, a very specific resonance and atmosphere, which I think matches where we hope we will find <laughs> the, re the, the real area. The, have you been, what have you been feeling as we walked through that beautiful bluebell wood? and ended up in this specific place. I feel like this could be a contender. And, um, you know, we've spoken about the idea of around that time they, they might even have been inspired by stories like the famous five, you know, gathering together, going off on an adventure. I feel like this is, you know, it's beautiful, but at the same time it has these dangers. Mm. And that is something that children are kind of attracted to mm. because it's a challenge, it's a dare. It's, it's another world, mm. you know, I'm getting tingles down my spine as I'm saying that. I can, you can just imagine what it would be like for them. And it's on their doorstep. Yeah. It's enticing. Yes. So behind the wall we have uh, a part of a, quite a, an affluent estate made up of 1930s, quite large houses. So, you know, but the theory is that the kids would have probably come from, you know, house or houses that are close by. So. They would, they would have been, you know, uh, exposed, I suppose, to, to books at the time from those kind of families. They would, you know, they wouldn't have been deprived of, of those things, and especially within the school as well. You know, the school library would have had them. But we're saying about Angela, who was one of the older um, girls in the group. She had visited Woolerton uh, a few weeks before at the end of the summer holidays, and she had encountered this gnome. I think it was her and a friend. 
and probably encourage the rest of the kids to sort of jump the fence, be naughty and come and find them and, and immediately, literally as soon as they came over the fence they had, had this fantastic encounter so we're going to move on, uh, there's a bit more marshalling, we're not going to wade through the, the boggy bit, um, I, I think we'll end up becoming quite stuck in there so we're going to move round uh, from the top and look down into, into the vista and see if we can find uh, other contenders. I've seen it twice now, so I know I won't make it up. Mm. I've seen two speckles of white dots there, where that branch is extending out over the water. Mm. I saw one, and it went a bit like a flash of light, and then the, the next one was a bit closer, but in that same location. You said in the gnomes was that yeah. they emit the light. Mm. Um, and I, I, when I came in here, I know it sounds really freaking strange, I got the sense that this is where they kind of hid to come out. This kind of area, this, yeah. this is the kind of area where they would have kind of just squirreled themselves away. And I was just saying to Neil over there, he was looking over the lake there, was it sort of a lake, and I saw um, two flashes of white light. Did you? One, I thought, well, is that the rain? Yeah, yeah. And then, a couple of seconds later, I saw the same thing again, but probably four feet away from where I saw the, the first one. And this with, with was, this was that, that big, up in, wow. up in the trees, and it went like that and through, through the tree line. Wow. It, was, uh, it was probably bigger than a football. Look, look, look at this. Whoa, what do you, you call it? The bog. How, how they contorted themselves. <laughs> Towards the light. They the, the tangle, don't they? And they, they all fight for the light. Well, here we are in front of the main house at Woolerton um, with, with the front elevation behind us. But we haven't really been here to see the house today. We've been here to tour the park. It's been a great day. It's the 6th of May, 2023, and the weather's held out. And we think we may have found the spot where the children of Woolerton came over the wall and experienced the known entities. We think we've found the spot. Can't be sure, but there's a marshy area where we where we did some filming, so that's the, mo the most likely candidate that, that, that we've come across. Unfortunately, we didn't see any gnomes today, uh, but that just means that obviously there's more research needed to be mm. done, mm. and we'll have to come back again. Yes and perhaps you know with the, if the atmosphere is, is a little bit different you know something else could happen but we weren't really here to see the gnomes we were here to find out where the children may have experienced um the the entities back in 1977. Nine. 77? 79? 79 what am i talking yeah. about i was born in 77. <laughs> <laughs> back in september 1979. so uh, uh that's it we've wrapped the day up it's been a great day and what do you think about it, Jo? I feel for me today's been kind of opportunity to 
uh, get to know this place, get to know the land, kind of meet it as if it's almost kind of a personality in itself, it's get to know its character. And in that even, we've met different aspects of it because it felt at times like we were going into different rooms yeah. within this within this place and it feels I mean there were real pockets where there's some mm. meaty stuff kind of pokey stuff going on mm. which will be very exciting to come back and explore further so for me today I feel like I've kind of met and got to know this place and look forward to you know coming back again and, and getting getting a bit further further into um, what might be here. Mm. I mean we spent a lot of time uh, we spent what about four hours four hours ish um, in the park and we've literally covered half of it um, I, I got the feeling last time I came to do a recce that it was over down towards the lake but we we also have woodland at the back of us um, it would be nice next time to have a look at the estates that are around and about um, and we're also going to have a look at the land and see if the land's actually changed to to see whether things like has the marshland moved um, and that kind of thing so we've got loads of further research to do which is going to be be exciting but for me it is always coming you know when you've researched something you've written about something coming and experiencing it um, and having that deeper understanding of the land has just been spectacular. And spending time with great friends. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been, it's been a fantastic day and I think we're moving forward with the project. Definitely, are we, we definitely are. Right, and um, thank you very much. Well, thanks Glenn for, for all your help. Ah, yeah, no, we must mention our fantastic cameraman who you can see at the moment, obviously. Uh, Glenn, who's uh, been investigating the hidden psychic aspects of all of the, the landscape that, that we've been around today in Wilson Park and he's, he's got a fine, finely tuned mind for this and he's been extremely helpful not only doing filming but in sort of pointing us in perhaps one direction that we may not have gone on. It, it, it's just enough. And we owe you a beer, so thank you. <laughs>
there's the book there. Joe's holding up the book, so um, you oh. can. Oh, I... <laughs> it's a trio. Hey. hey. <laughs> Um, so if you want to catch up on that in a kind of um, in a research aspect, this is a really good book. I'm not just saying that because we're all in it. Um, well, I am just saying that because we're all in it. But it is really good if you want to do the research aspect. If you want to know more about the, the Woolerton names, there, there's lots on the Internet. Uh, I know myself and Neil have done a, um, a chat about it um, in the videos below. So uh, have you, Joe? have you have you caught up and, and, and done anything on your podcast about it yet? I don't think I have. Um, I can't remember. I think at one point I was thinking about reading my piece. I think I may have done that. Yeah, I did. I did do that. I read my essay to patrons. That's what I did. Um, yeah, but we, you know, I think what I was saying earlier was that we, having visited there now and rereading all of the the research, it's just an entirely different thing altogether to 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 now have met that landscape and to know it even a little bit because we didn't get to see all of it did we but it just brings everything to life doesn't it it really does kind of allows you to to see through the eyes of the children to some degree because you're kind of at least partly familiar with the landscape now definitely and I think we're all in that kind of childish frame of mind as well in the in the best possible way you know it was a good fun weekend and although we were there to do uh, to do some field work and, and some research it was nothing with a serious edge which it, it just it just led to me for that that anticipation of what we were doing and that little bit of naughtiness of trespass that we did ourselves with you know kind of heightened heightened the situation so uh, we did also have along with us uh, Glenn Bodice, who is a, uh, a medium um, and a psychic, and he did some uh, recording for us. So uh, at some stage, that that footage will be out and about, hopefully. Um, so Neil, do you want to do you want to just say how we started off the day? What 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 kind of plan did we have? Did did we have a plan? Oh, it was planned like a military operation. Okay, didn't you notice? Yes. <laughs> Okay, it was it was a bit of a jolly. That was one aspect of it, absolutely no doubt about it. And it was a very pleasant day. Um, and as you've just mentioned, Glenn, okay, I think I think Glenn added a lot to that day. Um, he's the, he's a genuine psychic, and we perhaps went part into parts of the park that we wouldn't have gone into if he hadn't been tapping in into some of the vibrational energy in those parts uh, of the of the park so thank you glenn not just for his film work but for also adding uh, an extra dimension to, to the day um uh, as i said before it was a bit of an eye opener for me because as much as you read the accounts of the children from 1979 when this incident happened and even looking at, at, at maps and finding other things out about Wollaston Park, as well as all of the other encounters that happened uh, both previously to 1979 and afterwards, being there added so much. And we do need to go back again because we only had a few hours there. It was uh, it was a bit rainy. It wasn't ideal conditions, and it would be really to go good to go back there and hone down on some of the areas that we went. So let me just say something about that. Is putting my archaeological hat on. The the part of this project needs to be some pretty hardcore landscape archaeology. And that includes things like map regressions so that you go back through the historical maps. It will be looking at documentary evidence from you know the last 200 years of how that park has developed over time, because I think that's one of the keys to understanding um, for, for, for one thing, where the incident happened. And I think pinning down exactly where it happened is quite important especially if we're going to go back with perhaps not just glenn but you know your, your good selves 
I'm as, I'm as psychic as a plank of wood. So, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I will look at it from one, from one perspective, but that psychic, empathetic perception of the areas is good. And if we can pin down from the archaeological, historical evidence where this happened, that will sort of give us a bit of a, a, a razor view of, uh, of, of, the, of the incident. So in respect to that, I haven't yet done that intensive research. I will, because it's part of this project and like, you know, I'm an archaeologist and so I guess I'm the person to do it. Now, just one thing that I want to really point out is that we went to, we went in most most parts of the park, but we went to uh, the, the southwest of the park, which is a marshy area. And this is very important to the story because the the kids some of them fell into a marsh and they described it as the as as i think they describe it as a swamp, swamp. and there is really at the moment only one area in the southwest of the park that matches that description there are discrepancies in the children's descriptions about where they got into the park uh, and, and where they exited the park whether we you know that that needs a little bit further investigation but this area where we went is it's very dis difficult to describe without the, without the visuals but basically it's a, it's a it's a swampy marshy area but there are also historical archaeological features most importantly an embankment around this area now I have I have no direct proof of this at the moment, but I would suggest that several hundred years ago that would have been a fish pond. Those kind of embankments were only made for 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 fish ponds, and the age of the trees growing upon that embankment suggests that it was formed several hundred years ago, and I would say definitely as a fish pond. Now, I would say maybe in the 18th and 19th century, it would have ceased to be a fish pond and to become maybe a duck decoy. For those of you who don't know what a duck decoy is, it's not very pleasant, actually. It's um, it's an area of water which is contained so that the ducks come and uh, and roost in, 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 in that area. And then some aristocrats go out and shoot them. Mm -hmm. So it's not very pleasant, but that's a duck decoy. So I think that area, fish pond, duck decoy, and that, and then at whatever point that that duck decoy became disused, it reverted into that swamp, that, that that swampy marshy area of land. About I don't know about an acre of land. I would I, I would guess where we where we visited last last weekend. So 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 that's what's interesting me at the moment there's loads of other things i could say about the more esoteric uh, 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 esoteric parts of this story but i think if we ground it in that kind of you know good solid historical landscape archaeology then we might be a little bit closer getting to the bottom of things yeah, definitely. I think we all said that we wanted to do some overlaying of uh, of historical maps to look at the land. Joe, Joe, what kind of things highlighted for you over the weekend? What kind of things stood out? What kind of things were new that you didn't kind of expect to come out of the out of the visit? Um, I think what was really exciting for me was, I mean, I talked about in in the essay that I wrote. I talked about communion communing with the land and um I talked about liminality as well as kind of the history of the land and what it had been used for before and I did actually at the time overlay some maps so I, I got some interesting really old ones having a look at what was around there before which was not very much but you know there was always a site there um so when we were having a good old walk around with Glenn as you say Neil he was really really tuning in and and you know Kate and I we we do the same really we kind of tune into place what I found very interesting at one point was the part that Glenn was getting um he was getting a sense of f off from it 
and I kind of made my way round to enter that bit and I I couldn't get there because it was just so marshy so I was going this way and then I'd have to double back and going that way I have to double back um, and then you know I finally did get in but I had to pass a really uh, smelly part it was, it was a very offensive smell coming from the ground so it you know that was a that was a definite kind of keep back really um, so I did, I'm nosy enough. So I, I did make my way around eventually just to see sort of, you know, cause you were all kind of grouped there and see what was happening. And then when, after that, we sort of took a little walk and when I saw the gap in the fence and looked through and saw the hue of the bluebells, it really called to me. And as you say, we did then trespass a little bit cause we went through that, through that gate um is that okay to say yeah i mean the thing yeah. is about tres trespass trespass isn't illegal unless uh the landowner prosecutes and actually prosecution uh very rarely gets gets the go ahead uh for yeah. that and and the fact that i mean we were very respectful of course oh, of, of, of the environment yeah. so absolutely it, i mean it caught it was calling there's no two ways about it in the same way that that other little piece of the landscape was saying back off uh, this one was saying come in mm. um, and and we all felt it then we went in there it was a beautiful space um, to look at but also the feeling of it in there and there was one particular tree that was uh, quite a, a I can't actually remember what it was I'm not sure what it was but the character of that tree it was a, a quite a substantial fairly old tree and it seemed to kind of hold that space mm. and um I enjoyed sort of meeting with that tree and some other trees. And then when we found like further down, when we walked and found the swampy area, well, for me, that just, it, it felt a very magical setting and kind of going back to this idea of liminality that I spoke about in, in the essay that I wrote, it just, it ticked all the boxes, the feel of it. It felt, it felt magical. The, um, information that you provided Kate about the fact that the wall was running along at the back I, I didn't know anything about that about the, the situation of it so you know it kind of all links in but most strong of all was this feeling that it, it gave off down there and and the way that we came in through a way that we might not have done had we followed the path we were invited in and we were we were led to that spot from from a particular a particular way sort of through the magic, through the magic door, if you like, <laughs> we went through the magic door. So yeah, I think for me, it was firstly, I think, you know, great to to meet the, the park and the various aspects of it, but also to all be together mm. and to see what each of us kind of brought to it. And Glenn as well was a big part of that. And even, you know, your partner, Graham and, um, and oh gosh, um the oh, doggy's name Wilma Wilma <laughs> <laughs> you know there's Wilma trotting alongside and yeah I I just felt that that was it was it was great it was a really it was a really great weekend it was a really great day there like Neil says it was raining a bit so um that was a bit of a shame but you know we got through it and and I look forward to getting back there and, and having another bash really yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, the rain was a was a blessing because it meant less people, True. which meant there was there was an element that we had the park not to ourselves, but it, you know, people were sporadic. I've been there before when it's been absolutely ram packs and all all the kind of walkways around and about. There's just so many people. I think from from hitting the ground running, um, we came we we all gathered to have a have a drink and go to the cafe and whatever and we came out after meeting Glenn there and it was like instantly you know um Glenn was drawn to a particular tree that was just footsteps away from coming coming out of that cafe area and and that set the tone really it was you know we, we started thinking and chatting about 
pareidolia, um, you know, aspects of not just the esoteric, but of also, you know, having more of a critical thought about uh, about things. And we, we discussed things like is pareidolia simply pareidolia and what arise are picking up or is it uh, spirits of nature pushing through these uh, these trees and, and what have you and we've uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Joe and I will share with you at some point a, a photograph that was taken that has exactly that in it and it's a question mark of whether it's pareidolia or whether it's actually little people so that'll be exciting to keep your, your eyes peeled for and um, then we went on to that area Joe was just discussing uh, with you know that the Glenn definitely felt like there was a, a, a really offensive vibration from that area and he picked up on uh, what he described as a, as a hoggle type char character from the labyrinth that was uh, not impressed with us being there and it was telling us to back off. Now, usually when that happens, and I think it's my ghost hunter element, my, my paranormal research element, I get quite excited and quite giddy about the aspect of going into a place where I'm being told to F off. So I, I was quite uh, excited to be in there and I'd never do it disrespectfully, but I I, I am, I, I poke the bear sometimes, if you like, with, with that kind of thing and think, you know, why do you not want us to be there? It's got to be a good reason. Reason. and we were we were chatting around a fallen tree that um a, a, quite a large fallen tree and that seemed to be the center of where this energy was coming from and and i actually found a randomly found a geocache which piqued my childish interest in 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 the day and sort of added to that excitement um as we as we've been talking about we all got drawn into this this area with the most ultraviolet bluebells just blooming and I think there was a there, for me there was a different uh, sense there was a sense of calm in that first that first part of um, of that wooded area it was definitely calm and uh, Joe the tree that you were talking about I've got some lovely photos of you and you actually look like a gnome because the tree's that big <laughs> it's that big that you you look quite small next to it so we, we spent some time uh, chatting in there I think for me the whole weekend uh, the essay that I wrote in uh, Simon's book was about uh, there is more questions than answers with this and the more we get into it the more questions that I have you know of uh, like Neil suggested it's it's about the the children is there terminology about what a swamp or a marsh, it, marsh is different to ours um, I've been questioning you know what was the weather like uh, running, leading up to that particular incident did it make areas of that that land more marshy uh, more boggy um, there are there are so many questions that have come out of this you know it's it's unbelievable and I think for me one of the aspects is going to be trying to find people who lived in the area at that time and, and asking them about what they remember about the, the landscape of the park because I think that's going to be really important as well so what what's for the future for, for you both for this where, where where do you kind of where do you want to head with it what, what do you want to do with it I, I think that we we will obviously go back and like i say we need to do a little bit more of a an intensive study of the whole park um uh, but i think part of this you know I, i've been talking about you know landscape archaeology and historical map regression uh, uh, which 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 is what we need to do but certainly for me the weekend showed that there is nothing to replace being yeah. within the landscape mm -hmm. on site and just picking up those intuitive feelings because I know I said I'm as psychic as a plank of wood but when we were in that marsh area I knew I was on the cusp of uh, an, an altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. of some sort and it was I, I wasn't able to go into that fully because I was with you lot you know you were you were putting me off but um uh, and it's, it's not nothing to do with the mushrooms that you were eating the night before uh, well yeah, that that may have changed everything um completely um and well we're we're, we're among friends here and I, I i will say that if i went there on my own um having taken a small dose of psychedelics of whatever sort i think that may take me that may have taken me over the edge because I f felt just intuitively empath empathetically however you want to phrase it that 
is a special area there is so we've been talking about you know the beauty of the the, the bluebells the feeling that, that it was in, in an inviting place when we got to that marsh area there was something something there there, there was just something there that we, we weren't maybe we weren't ready to tap into completely on that day but uh i think this is important this this is part of the new modern research in order to try and put yourself in the position of those children obviously we can never do that but you can do it to a certain degree you can do it with your uh, you can tap into a bigger consciousness of which they were a part and if that place is special enough and that place is special then you might be able to get something out of the story that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do uh, and which to be honest so far we haven't quite quite got there so 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 I, i'm just saying that we we definitely need to go back and we probably all need to take lsd before <laughs> i think you're going to be on your own with that one mate. <laughs> <laughs> my days are well and truly over <laughs> i uh, i can offer an alternative and it's something that i <clears throat> i sort of explored when we were there but i didn't really kind of uh, go go full all away with it but I started collecting nettles when we were under that first was it a chess what was it I think it was a chestnut wasn't it tree, where, where are you talking about you the know first the, the first big beautiful tree with the red with the red leaves oh was it a copper no beach? no that's a copper uh, that beach. was the copper beach that was yeah. the copper beach tree yeah so um yeah I started collecting nettles there and and what I like is to collect say some nettles maybe some cleavers obviously it depends on the time of year um you know dandelions whatever's growing at the time and coming home and making some kind of tea because I feel like then especially if we could get some round where that swampy place is or we could do a little experiment we could we could get some from the beautiful hue place um we could get some I, I collect some from the copper beach um which I felt was a welcome as we entered the park really and then we could get some from the from the magical area and we could you know taste those because i think in the same way same sort of way that you you can go into different uh, states with um, psychedelics you can use just the um the you know these plants from those particular areas and ingesting them it's a communion it's a form of communion so that's one thing I think would be really interesting to do and just to do it and then compare notes afterwards what what are you feeling you know what are you getting any sensations or messages or you know visuals or anything like that the other thing we could do which I think might be interesting is to go to those spaces and maybe we could get a bit giddy and chant or do something that is playful movement would be good because the the gnomes, by all the descriptions, they like laughter. They were attracted. They seem attracted to children's joy. You know, and I I know this. I've seen it before. I've seen this before. Okay, if a child loses themselves in play, which you can get through, um, you know, running and uh, going in a circle with each other and chanting, and that is fun for adults too. If you let yourself go. I think that would be a really good way of getting into an altered state as well. So as an alternative to psychedelics, this is something that might be available to us. And, you know, we can just play with it, really. So I'm, I'm, I'm up for that. I'm up for that when, you know, we get together again. Can we do both? You could absolutely do both. Absolutely. I think, you know, um, the, this, this is a kind of more accessible for, for, for everybody. Um, as I say, like, like Kate, I haven't done psychedelics since for many years. Um, so. <laughs> I, Not that know. we're promoting the use of psychedelics. <laughs> no, absolutely kind of, absolutely kind of, I, I no. like, I like the idea of a tea ritual. Yeah. And I think, I think as an add on to that, what I'll do is, um, because I'm the closest, I'm, I'm half an hour away from site. I think what I'll do, um, is go down, um, maybe, uh, just after summer solstice and do some picking uh, see what's down there dandelions nettles cleaver what whatever um, I'll see if there's any mushrooms Neil um, 
that that aren't going to kill you um and and just just do do a recce as well i i want another recce and i think you're absolutely right about uh, right, bringing that childish element i think one of the things that that occurred because we were so excited to be there and to be together because it's the first time that we've sort of been together on the ground um, and doing the field work it, it kind of made it a very strange um energy level between us because we you know we were excited to do the research which is a very adult thing to do but we're excited to be together and for me I, I was in sensory overload which was just brilliant you know it was great company we're all there for the same reason beautiful surroundings and I was not really able to focus on on the feeling of things so like you Neil saying that if you'd been you know had the opportunity and I think as well as that playful element, Joe, I think, you know, having the opportunity after that, maybe to sit down and I know we all do this, but meditate and just uh, just zone out into into that space. So, yeah, we, we should all definitely get back together um, sooner rather, rather than later and go and go down and, and do that. I was just saying, though, um, earlier on today about um this is this is an exciting aspect for me is about the the on i'm a field re researcher that you know being a paranormal investigator it's it's something that i do where i'm i'm in the field researching it's it's very rare that you can get the opportunity to do um extensive research as you would do with a fairy um encounter so backgrounds you, you just do background searches on land and on building um but it doesn't generally you know it's not as substantial as it is within within fairy investigation so it seems to be a flip side with a fairy investigation where people and quite rightly there is a substantial amount of research in a bookish sense where you sit down you go through books and you go through maps and whatever else but actual field work either i think this is going to be a, a hopefully an infectious side to, to the Fairy Investigation Society, where I know people are going out in the field and, and checking things out and, and what have you, but being able to report back on it in, in, a, in a serious way, you know, and, and have it added to the, the academic um, swish and melting pot of things that's going on around uh, around different encounters. So yeah, it's exciting and I, I, and I hope we can expand out and do some more. So if anybody's got any suggestions about cases that you'd like to see us all going out and, and, and trudging around in the rain with our anoraks looking like scout leaders um then then let us know you know drop something in the comment and say you should go i don't know oh let's go up to scotland and uh, yeah it'd be nice to get some uh, some very rich person to fund us on that so if anybody's listening they've got a couple of million stashed away that, that you know you want to send us off on on wild goose chases then then please do well Any... gnome chases <laughs> yes yes we we are the nomateers we are the three nomateers <laughs> So any any last thoughts um, uh, to round things up? Joe? I'm having that's my thinking face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you caught you caught us out with that one, Kate. Uh, sorry. I, sorry. I, 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 I think you know this is this has been quite useful to as with any field work of whatever type, whatever um, discipline you're talking about you can't just go out do the field work and then just disperse and do your own thing so yeah. getting together like this is extremely useful mm. it's just another uh, a, a, another cog another movement forward to what has been quite a long drawn out project in in all of its manifestations and all of its aspects so this i see as the next stage because the next thing i will do is get my archaeological hat on and really sort of start thinking a little bit seriously about about this and try to just just try to map things out physically and mentally in 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 terms of what 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 was happening in 1979 and what what we can find out about it and how we can put a load of detail onto it so that's sorry for... neil i just had a vision then of you in some bell bottom sort of wandering around bulletin next time we go just getting into that full-on 70s vibe just to just to pick up well well I, well i don't well i don't mean to name drop but i'm going to name drop in the um i was very good friends with professor mick aston of time oh, team oh yeah 
uh, who died in 2013. And we did several little landscape projects and I learned so much from him. As far as I'm concerned, he's the, he, he's the, the primary landscape archaeologist of the last hundred years. He, he just, he, he just, he was fantastic. And I learned bags from him. Uh, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to put this into action and, and Mick, Mick would have loved this project. He'd, he'd have dismissed the fairies. Well, that's a load of nonsense. But this landscape's absolutely fascinating. So let's go. Let's go. Let's go and investigate it. So, so I will put on. Uh, I, I will take take what I've learned from the great late great Mick Aston, and I will really get in get get into this. This, this kind of gets my this this gets my undercurrents going because i haven't done it for for quite a few years and it, i usually used to love it i used to love this mm. landscape archaeology stuff and so um you can leave that to me i'll get on with it and um uh, that will it, i think it's important it's, it gives a a substratum that kind of very physical material yeah. Uh, way of looking at, at this project, it gives that substratum, and then you can build all of the the more esoteric, occult, whatever you want to call it, stuff on top of that. And I think that also helps for anyone coming from the outside who's a little bit unsure. Oh, you know, fairies. Uh, do, do I really want to think about that? Gnomes. This is all just a bit of nonsense, isn't it? As soon as you, as, as soon as you give the, that bedrock of a kind of academic understanding, then those people will be more likely to come on board and they won't think we're just a bunch of nutcases. They'll think, well, actually these people actually might 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 be getting a little bit close to the truth, whatever that truth is. I can say I'll go full nutcase and <laughs> uh, take take care of that side of things by um <laughs> I, I can I feel drawn to maybe connecting in with the area, um, asking permission from the gnomes there or the beings that exist there um, about us coming coming back and creating some kind of poem chant um, that that's often in ritual, uh, especially by myself. That would be how I would connect with whatever whatever work I'm doing it will be through through voice and and song and repetition so I'll I'll have a go at that and I'll maybe create something for us that we can explore the next time we get together there um and yeah do a lot of tuning in as I say and I will keep you posted about that of how how that's looking brilliant brilliant so um I think I will Remember to take my paranormal equipment next time. I think we were we were too busy for me to to take any any tech down there. For I think if we can get some baseline data readings uh, in the different environments uh, for EMF, uh, do some uh, EVP work, so electronic voice phenomena. See if we can get anything back from that. Um, that would be that would be very very interesting. So again, add into kind of a, a, a portfolio of, of building up a, a picture of, of yes, it, th this is definitely somewhere where gnomes are. I also think that it's going to be important for us to start exploring the psychology of the children. So uh, I've got a background in education. I can maybe call on some people, um, ed psychologists or teachers to discuss, you know, I mean, it, it takes a, a pretty strong stomached head teacher because the head teacher did believe and record um an interview and interviewed the the children um about this in which is which is one of the aspects that makes it such a, a strong case and it's from my knowledge and I've I've worked in many 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 schools around around this county in particular I can't think of one head teacher now that would do that that would be like yeah I believe you I'm going to record you and I'm going to support you um in the fact that journalists are going to come along etc so that's that's another aspect as well that we can look into is is what what kind of psychology was going on um behind that I'm super excited to get back there I, I kind of want you guys to come back to come back down next weekend or something and <laughs> and uh an old trip off down there but I'm gonna I'll do a couple of recce's um in in the meantime 
Can, um, I, can, I, can I just add, that just while I'm thinking about it, I mean, I don't want people to think that it's just Joe, Kate and I doing this. This is, yeah. you know, we, we, we are maybe the sort of core of the project at the moment, I guess. But, you, you know, well, obviously Simon Young is, he's the person who really started to investigate this in any kind of depth so, so there's him there's uh Maeve and Dan doing the dow dowsing uh Glenn who we've, who we've already talked about and there are many other people sort of on the periphery of this mm -hmm. and maybe some more people will come in with different skill sets who can offer something something else to it it's a this isn't a call to arms for anyone to sort of get involved but i think you know the bigger the team is uh, with cu cu coming with all kind of different disciplinary specialities um the the, the, the better the project will be yeah definitely i think we, we we will drag drag people in kicking and screaming and say you are coming gnome hunting with us and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll be sold they'll be sold they'll just go yes i want to come gnome hunting and, and off we go yeah. Uh, yeah i definitely think a big shout out for um for simon young young the uh, fairy godfather for getting us all together and sort of setting us on this path of the Woolerton gnomes and giving us the opportunity to to write for that book which is really cemented i think um a lot of people together um under the fairy investigation society so uh, well done the fairy godfather for that very much so yeah yeah good stuff and um yeah look, look forward to what comes next me too